when he when he goes to his first yes please as a matter of fact i'm not yeah lee what do you think should we send him some, some cookies or okay no, no i don't think so either i don't i think that's been universally true universally true for boot camp yeah and um, you don't want to get smoked any extra than you already are so that's why he wanted all the letters in one envelope so we'll help take care of that um if you have your bibles we're going to be um jumping around a little bit we're going to be jumping around in the word of god talking about samson um most of you know a couple weeks ago my mother um was had a heart attack and was in the hospital and for about three days she didn't know what planet she was on and i really didn't i mean i hope for the best but medically i just expected the worst um and and i i, I was there my, my, anyway the circumstances the situations were I, I was in the hospital about two and a half days um with her and i just got to knowing on things and and um I, I was i was praying about what to preach on and and i thought about the the spiritual games people play. Anyway, we're going to be talking about Samson today. And I told Miss Dean, I don't know how it came up. I started my sermon in the hospital. And when I kind of finished where I was going with Samson, it was about 7,500 words. Well, my average, don't be afraid. My average sermon is about 2,000 words. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm not finishing in this week. And I'm not going to finish next week either. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're going to be talking about Samson and about the games people play spiritually. And I'm going to go back to a few years of something Pastor Andy Stanley said. Pastor Andy Stanley said this, for Christians, the best question ever is not whether something is a sin. It's, is this the wisest choice for me to make at this season in my life? For Christians, the best question, go back for me, please, Amir. The best question ever is not, is this a sin or not? Is, is it the wisest choice for me to make at this season in my life? Because we like to live at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We like to know, is this wrong or is it not? And while there's nothing wrong with wanting to know whether something is, is this wrong or is it not wrong? The question we need to be asking, is this the wisest thing for me to do at this season in my life? Because there are some things that are not sins that are not wise for you to do. Are you listening to me? If you don't get anything else today, get that. There are some things that are not sinful, but they are not wise for you to do. All of us have been there, and all of us have a different thing that is our weakness. And for us, sometimes it's not the wisest thing to do. It's not whether it's a sin or not. We like to know if it's a sin or not because we can live by the rules instead of listening to the Holy Spirit. Because even if you're not a Christian, you have a pretty good idea about whether something is right or wrong or sinful or not. Most of you, even if even before you were saved, you had a pretty good idea about whether something was right or wrong, didn't you? I, I know I did. That's why, and some preachers would disagree with me, and and I'm willing to be wrong. But there are there have been couples in the past who have come to me and said we would like to get married, but we we're pregnant. And the church that we were going to use will not marry us in the sanctuary. Will you marry us? <coughs> okay. So my personal ministry philosophy that I'm willing to be wrong about is if I tell them, well, no, I'm not marrying you in a church either. Have I? Anybody here not messed up before? If, if, if you're perfect, please come pray for me after church. I need you. What are you saying, Ken? Now, I do hold them to a standard, just in case you want to know. The couple that comes to me and says, we're pregnant and we're not married, but we want to get married. Will you marry us? I say, absolutely, but you have to sleep in separate beds and not do anything until you get married. So, I'm, yeah, I've had people say no. <laughs> but, I, but I try. And I try to help them understand and see the grace of God. Because even though they don't need somebody else to tell them they've done something wrong. Anytime you've done something wrong, do you need, really need anybody to tell you you've done wrong? When you get pulled over, do you really want them to say, uh, really want to grill you? No. You just want to give that license and registration, don't you? <laughs> and, and just get it over with. Unless you're one of those, unless you're one of those people that when you get nervous, you lie. <laughs> and I know some of y'all are that way because it's human nature. But see, officer, what had happened was is. 
No, just license and registration. You did wrong. All of us know that feeling. You come over that hill on the interstate going 84, and he's sitting right there in the median, and you do, oh, 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 I'm caught. <laughs> and it's everything in you to fight to not hit that brake light, because you've heard them say before, when I see them brake lights, that's when I turn around on you. So it's everything inside your body not to go over and slam on them brakes, because when the nose of that car does like that, that's a red flag, too. <laughs> I'm trying to help you understand that when we take small steps of unwise choices and a chain of events that lead us to where we're not supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, now, I'm going to confess something, okay? I have gone over the speed limit before in my life. I know. I know some of y'all probably don't do that. But I have before. But when you really sit down and think about that thing, when you go five more miles per hour over the speed limit, that means for every hour you drive, you're only going to get there five minutes early, right? Did I just do that right? Close to about, about, about that man? So if you go 10 over, oh, you get there a little faster. And so does your insurance. You talk, talk to Angela. She, she'll help you figure out what you need to do. She works with that stuff. Anybody here learn the hard way? What did five minutes, extra five minutes will cost you? Let alone, let alone us going 10 over and we're going 15 miles. How many minutes are you saving? Not a lot. I'm not a math major. I don't know. But it's those small decisions. And a lot of times it works out on the interstate like this. Where there's people passing me like I'm tied to the highway. So I'm going to get that lane over there. And before you know it. You're passing people who look like they might be tied to the highway. And you think, okay, I'm good. I'm going with the flow of traffic. Am, am I preaching to anybody? Is anybody know what I'm talking about? Those small steps. First you're going five over. And then, well, I'm just going to go seven. Well, I'm just going to go 12 this one time. And next thing you know, you're pulling 90. Little things will get you. Well, Winnie's always asleep. She said, mm, like she didn't know. She's always sleeping. You know, you, you, a little thing, a little thing, a little thing will lead you to where you're not supposed to be. The best illustration I can think of, because that's why I put it on the screen, is dominoes. Now, most people don't play dominoes for what dominoes were made for, but if, if I had if I had the budget and, and, and people to do it, I, I would have had great big fake dominoes made. And, and most of us use it for cause and effect and correlation of one thing leads to another thing that leads to another thing. And, and it goes it goes a lot to that, that phrase that, that no man is an island, no man stands alone, that you don't make a decision in a vacuum that's the, the only decision. That we have things that one thing leads to the other. And just like dominoes, we don't use them, but we use them to teach cause and effect. Cause and effect. They're wonderful teachers of how the consequences of our choices can start something that continue on and how something small can become larger and larger. The Bible has a lot to say to anyone who will listen, but the Bible has a lot to say to the Christians about our choices and how our children and grandchildren can inherit spiritual generational curses. Let me tell you something. Anything that you're struggling with your grandparents struggled with it. They were just better at hiding it than you are. Some of you struggle with, with whatever, you, you, you name your vice, whatever it is. If you struggle with pornography and you're a man, your granddaddy struggled with it too. It just gets stronger and bigger every generation. The same way, the same way how other, you struggle, you struggle with tobacco or alcohol or drugs or you, you, you name it, whatever it is. Whatever they hid, you are struggling with it now. And they didn't talk about that stuff years ago. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it because if you can break, listen to this now. I know I've already told you one thing to remember, but remember this. If you in Christ can break the generational curse on you, your children and grandchildren can be free of that. I want the manure. Because that's all it is, manure in your life that does nothing but make things worse. You can break. If your daddy 
and your granddaddy and your great granddaddy drank and beat his wife, you don't have to drink and beat your wife. You do not have to let the nature that you grew up in condemn you as a believer. You can be delivered from that mess. So, my dad. My dad broke one. My dad doesn't talk about it much, but I'll go ahead and tell y'all because y'all know my dad. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, hardworking, big man. Did not kiss or hug his boys. He did his daughters, but not his boys. And my daddy told me as a, as a little boy, I always wanted my daddy to hug me and kiss me. And he said, if I ever get married and have children, I'm going to hug them and kiss them. So I come along and then my brother comes along. My daddy had no example because my grandfather did not model that for him. So when I was in seventh grade, my daddy would drop my brother and off early before he went to work, drop us off at school. We were still kissing my daddy on the mouth and hugging him by. And in seventh grade, I had to tell mama, mama, I don't know how to tell you this, but you gotta tell daddy we can't kiss him no more. <laughs> but he didn't know. And he was breaking an example. So to now today, I'm constantly pinching my children, popping them on the behind. It, some of y'all don't do that to your children. You might be too late now, but but we're gonna frolic. We, we're gonna we're gonna hug. I'm gonna put you in a headlock. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do appropriate touching because my dad sewed into me. I'm able to take it and go another step to do something that generationally, from what I understand, my grandfather was not able to model for my dad. Just because you came up a certain way does not mean you have to be that way. I am constantly struggling with the flesh that I grew up with and the man I want to become. Y'all aren't listening to me. I'm constantly struggling with things that I want to break off of my family as a generational curse that I inherited by what's called nature and nurture. I'm constantly in a struggle with this flesh man and the spirit man to crucify those things. And part of that stuff is what I yell at Winnie about. Because I know how to do ugly. I know how to do six foot two, 300 pounds ugly. But the Holy Spirit does not let me do ugly. You understand? And a lot of times the Holy Spirit through Winnie's voice will say something that's totally different than what I want to do. And then it goes back to the conversation I told you before. I totally disagree with you, but I believe you. Now leave me alone. I just need to cool off. Some of y'all probably don't talk to your spouse like that, but we talk to each other like that. The Bible has a lot to say about our choices. And for you to understand, for you to start something, you have the humongous potential of your children and grandchildren being addicted and tied to that thing like the yoke of an oxen. You understand me? When, when I spoke to the teenagers about this a few years ago, they used to yoke. Everybody knows what a yoke is, right? Not, not an egg yoke, but, but the yoke across the, the shoulders of, of a beast of burden. They used to put that gigantic wooden yoke on, a, on an ox when he was very young. And, and then years later, he's thousands of pounds and can, and can, he don't pull, he actually pushes. He can push thousands of pounds and no man could hold him back. But because he was yoked so young, they, they can make him do anything they want him to do. And when we don't break off the yoke in our life, our children and grandchildren will spiritually, and y'all ain't listening to me, will inherit a yoke that will bind them and curse them, and they have to struggle with stuff at the altars that you should have repented of when you had the chance. I'm not a great preacher, but I'm preaching a whole lot better right now than y'all are shouting. Maybe you're just taking it all in. Or you're thinking, I don't know what Ken drank for his breakfast this morning, but he needs more of it. I had keto coffee. <laughs> you don't know what keto coffee is, I'll tell you later. Pastor Ron Carpenter says it like this. Most of the things, y'all remember when we used to have altar services that would just last until it was over? No specific time, it just... Most of the stuff... 
that adults struggle with are things that they got yoked with before they were 18 years old. The enemy has always tried to destroy humanity as early as possible. In the Exodus, in the book, in the book of, in the book of uh, Exodus, what did Pharaoh tell the nursemaids to do to those babies? Kill them on the birthing stool. Back back in those days, women, Hebrew women, would give birth on an apparatus that was like a stool. So they called it a birthing stool, and they wanted he wanted he wanted those children to die while they were in the process of the woman giving birth, partial birth abortion is what it is. He wanted to kill them on the birthing stool. He's always so the vices that we struggle with. Most of us struggle with things that we were yoked with before we were 18 years old, and if you can strive to get free of that. Your children can live in freedom. I don't know anything more valuable than all the silver and the gold in the world that my children not have to struggle with the things that I struggle with spiritually. You hear me? That is why it's important as a Christian. I can't tell you where the line is between when he said it. That's true. A Christian can sin, but the book of uh, First or Third John says there's a difference between sinning and practicing sin. You can sin and still be saved, but if you continue to practice sin, that's a whole other conversation. I don't know where that line is that says, okay, now you're not saved. Only thing I can tell you is what our faith tradition teaches and preaches and believes. It's important not only to be saved, but seek to be sanctified from the things from the, okay, so saving you is you acknowledging you need to stop sinning and you have sinned. Sanctification takes the want to out of you. The illustration that Bishop Tony Miller says is you can muzzle a bulldog and he won't bite you. But you walk by him and he'll go, <laughs> he's still got bite left in him. Sanctification takes the bite out of you. Sanctification from the dominion, from the the Bible says you are going to be a doulos, a slave of something. Ken, I've grown. I'll do what I want to do. You are a fool if you believe you're not being manipulated by either the enemy or by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Sanctification delivers you from the dominion of sin and is followed by a lifetime growth in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Salvation saves you, but sanctification cleans you up and sets you apart for your soul to whatever you inherited as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So sanctification is an instantaneous thing and is an ongoing thing. Can, can you give me an example? I'm glad you asked me. I'm a recovering pornography addict. Oh, my God. Did he just say what do you think? He said, I sure did. About 19 years ago, I repented to my wife, and I repented to the Lord. And for years, I was going to school online. I would not get up. Y'all remember when the computer monitors used to be big as this table right here? You had one room the computer was in. For years, I wouldn't get on the computer unless Wendy was in the room. She got so mad at me sometimes. I'm right here watching television. I'm just on the other side of this wall. I'm trying to protect me and I'm trying to protect our family. I want you in here, do something while I'm on this computer. Well, you're supposed to be on your college website. I'm just telling you, I was supposed to be on my Bible college website when I started doing stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing too. Y'all ain't listening to me. I'm, I'm spilling my guts in front of y'all. To today, I got a computer with me all the time. There's one up there. There's one in my office. And I don't I don't struggle with it the way I did the first week, the first month, the first year, the first two years. God sanctified me and is in the process of sanctifying me. To the point of if I do stumble on or open something or something inappropriate comes through or I see something, I immediately send Winnie a message. 
and say, at 1.38 p.m., this is what I was doing, and this is what happened, and it lasted three seconds. Ken, that's a little too much. I'm just telling you, my family and my, what God's call on my life is worth more than that thrill. So I'm locked up in this. Y'all drive by and see me here sleeping? I'm just kidding. Y'all see me here by myself all the time? I'm here locked up with computers by myself, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not a fool and don't think it can happen again. But it doesn't. I don't struggle with that the way I used to for 19 years. 19 years clean. 19, 20 years clean. Now, for some of y'all, that might not be the problem. For some of y'all, it might be something else. But I can tell you something. The enemy of your soul knows what your weakness is. And he's going to do everything he can to manipulate you and put you in a position where you don't seek sanctification, but you seek self. And you don't seek to grow, but seek to find yourself, as Pastor Andy Stanley said, in a position where you say, well, it's not, it's not a sin. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not wise either. It's not wise either. So, so it filters all the way through my life to the point of I'm still spilling my guts to you. There are some shows on Netflix and Hulu that you watch that I can't watch. And it's not my job to tell you that you should watch them or you should not watch them. But the only thing I can tell you is if there's a show and they have to have graphic, or there's children here, if they have to have graphic adult scenes every episode, I can't watch that show. There are some great shows. But it, for some reason they have to put that in every episode. I'm striving to get to the point that I can please my Lord. I got a long way to go. Anybody have a long way to go? Anybody else have a long way to go? Tell the truth and shame the devil. You got a long way to go. But to seek sanctification, seek the face of God, to seek to please him in my actions, words, and deeds, and ask him to sanctify me from the power and the dominion and the slavery of sin. I want to be a slave of Christ. The dominoes of your ancestors are not a life sentence for you. Through salvation and sanctification, you can remove a domino from the domino effect of your family lineage. Are you listening to me? As a Christian, sanctification helps you. So, so if I had my dominoes here, they'd be doom, doom, and start falling. Doom, doom, doom. But, but with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can just take one right out. And when that one falls, boom, with you, it don't, it don't keep going. You can remove a domino. A Christian can have a domino removed, and your children don't have to deal with the things that you inherited from your people. And if you don't think your people are crazy, ask your spouse. <laughs> because love is blind, but families are not. And families are crazy. You hear me? Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to decide how much crazy we're willing to allow in our life for the rest of our lives. That's, who, that's what really determines it. We have to understand that a domino can be taken out and that we can break the bad things that came to us. We see in our mind's eye things that will lead us to one thing to another and how it bears results into a future a long way off. This morning I want to talk about Samson. I was thinking about some games that some biblical people have played that we could identify with and I want to talk about Samson. I spelled it wrong. It's not Samson like Samson County. It's supposed to be Samson, S-A-M-S-O-N. I want to talk about Samson. Samson's accomplishments are legendary, and yet at the same time, so are his weaknesses. As a matter of fact, Samson is a lot like most people I know, including myself. <laughs> Samson's accomplishments are legendary, but so are his weaknesses. He's a lot like most people including myself. So much God-given potential. And yet time and time again, he makes bad decisions and unwise choices that become self-destructive. God has given him, just like he's given all of us, potential for righteousness and movement in the kingdom of God. Yet over and over and over again, he made bad decisions. I'm going to summarize Samson's life with one statement. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. That is why 
It's a personal decision on what you do. You can be set up for success and still fail because you don't exercise a strong will. Well, Ken, you don't know what I've been through. I, that, my, my parents didn't love me, they beat me with barbed wire. Okay, that's terrible. But you don't have to live your entire life letting that be the only thing that, that influences your will and what you decide to do. Are you ready to be saved and sanctified? And, one, and sooner than later, we're going to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit because we are still a Pentecostal holiness church that believes in signs, wonders, and miracles and glossolalia, which is just a fancy way of saying speaking in tongues. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. We know Samson lived in the Old Testament, and from the beginning of Samson's life, the Spirit of the Lord stood with him, and God would come on him in supernatural ways, strengthen him beyond anything or anyone had ever seen. Samson's anointing from the Holy Spirit would give him incredible strength, and he was given incredible strength for a reason. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. The angel of the Lord told Samson's family that he was to live by the Nazarite vow. Now, you may have heard the expression, Jesus was from Nazareth. This is totally different than being a Nazarene. A Nazarite is something totally different than being a Nazarene. Samson's family was told by the angel of the Lord, when Samson is born, he is to be dedicated as a Nazarite. He is put, you are to, to make him take the Nazarite vow. Samson's mother was barren, and after prayer, God promised her a son that would become one of the leaders or Judges of Israel, when you look through your Bibles in the Old Testament, before they had an earthly king, and we're going to get to an earthly king right after Samson, we're going to start talking about King Saul, the first official earthly king of Israel and the games he played. But Samson was set apart to be, and they said he will be a Nazarite and he will be a leader of the nation of Israel, what are called the judges. Samson's mother was told this. And he led through the book of Judges and is to be a Nazarite. In the book of Numbers chapter 6, you can read about all the vows. But they were set up to, by God through Moses who those, for those who were not priests but could be set apart for the use and the glory of God. So in the Old Testament order, there were priests and there were Levites and there were Nazarites. Okay? So a priest, I think that's self-explanatory. A Levite could work with the priests in the tabernacle and in the temple. Every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. And then there were the Nazarites, those who were um, who took a vow to voluntarily serve the Lord. And in Numbers chapter 6, you can see all the details. A non-priest that did not want to be a Levite could start living these vows before the Lord. And would set themselves apart in devotion to God and everything. There were four main vows for the Nazarite. And I'll probably close with this. A Nazarite could not take strong drink. A Nazarite could not eat of the fruit of the vine. A Nazarite was never to have contact with a dead body. And a Nazarite did not cut their hair. So those are the four main requirements of a Nazarite. So here is the great leader with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on his life that would come and go and most of you if you grew up in or around church you know the gist of the story of Samson killing a thousand soldiers by himself how he ripped apart a bear excuse me how he ripped apart a lion with his bare hands and yet with all this God given potential his weak will got him into trouble time and time again and as we study the dominoes of Samson's life we see Samson betray God, and God's call on his life, forgive me for stupid things. As we study the dominoes of Samson's life, we see Samson betray God's call on his life, well, forgive me, for stupid things. Go back to the Nazarite vows for me, please. I'm here. Thank you. You're doing the pretty work back there. Could not take strong drink. Could not eat the fruit of the vine could not have contact with a dead body, could not cut their hair. But we're going to see him lose his temper and kill 30 innocent men because he loses a bet. Most of us are familiar with the story of Samson and Delilah. 
but there were a whole lot of steps and choices that he made that were not wise until he got to, do you know, do you know, do you know for, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but before Samson went and slept in the same bed with Delilah, he went 20 years ruling the nation of Israel righteously. 20 years. And yet before Samson's story is over, he, find, he finds himself in he finds himself in the bed with a woman that's trying to kill him. And he keeps going back. And I've heard preachers and teachers embellish on the, the sexual prowlessness and, and power of Delilah. The Bible says nothing about Delilah's measurements or her sexual prowess or, or what she did or how she did it to Samson. But it said the mighty man would lay his head in her lap. Now, I'm thick. I'll be honest with y'all. I'm thick. But if every time I wake up, there's people in the room trying to kill me, I'm going to start making some connections. <laughs> but he keeps going back. And he keeps going back. And there's something, the words, maybe when we get to heaven, we can watch the DVD and see that there's something about <laughs> Samson able to lay his head in her lap and relax enough to not think about, last time I did this, people tried to kill me. All that didn't happen overnight. We're going to see him, as we talk about Samson, pursue the wrong kind of woman and his lust for women again and again and again get him into trouble. But let us reiterate to not be too hard on Samson because we see many parallels in our own potential as Christians. Let us not be too hard. But when, I, when I first got saved, some of the best advice I ever got was to read the New Testament from beginning to end, and when you get to the read a chapter a day, and when you when you get to the end of Revelation, start again in, in, in Matthew and start reading again. And I've been reading the Bible for a few years, y'all, and, and I started reading about the disciples doing stupid stuff. I know I shouldn't say they were stupid. They were doing they did stupid stuff all the time. If you ever read the Bible, come on, tell me the truth. They did stupid stuff, didn't they? They did stupid stuff all the time. And one day, one day I was like, and one day I, I was actually foolish enough. I said to myself, I said, they ought to be ashamed of yourself. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> and I said that for many, 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 many years. And one day the Lord said, have you ever considered you might have done it before they did it? You might have been the one who did it? To be careful, matter of fact, the Bible, we've talked about this. The Bible says, be careful how you judge because you'll be judged by the same measure. And while the disciples, Samson, you name your biblical character. If, if I wrote the Bible, I wouldn't have put them stories in there. I wouldn't have put them stories in there about them doing stupid stuff. I would just put, them, put the good stuff. Just like, just like nowadays. We, we all have a... Well, tell the truth. When, you take, when somebody takes a picture of you, the first thing you want to say is what? Let me see it. Because if it ain't good, I want you to take it again. That's human nature. When you see a group photo, you don't look and see what Lee looks like in that picture. Who do you look for? Yourself. Yourself. And everybody else can look like sunshine and lollipops. But if you look like this, <laughs> you're mad because you know the preacher's going to put that on Facebook and you didn't want nobody to see you like that. If I'd have wrote the Bible, I wouldn't have put all them stories of people failing in there. I wouldn't have put all them stories about the weaknesses of Samson and the disciples. But thanks be unto God, I'm not God. And those men and women of God, those stories are in there for a reason. And I hope, before we finish talking about Samson, I hope today there's been a seed planted to help you understand the significance of the dominoes of your actions, words, and deeds, and how your children can inherit or you can break 
the spiritual curses that you inherited off of your life through Christ Jesus. To not only seek to be saved, but to be sanctified and delivered from the things that seek to keep you under the dominion of sin. I, I told you I was going to stop. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for your word that is true, that is sharper than a two-edged sword, that, Father, we see what's going on in the spiritual realm, that we stop playing games with you, God, that we stop taking things for granted, that we understand on a biblical way, in a biblical manner that we can not only be saved, but we can be sanctified from the decisions and the circumstances and the spiritual curses that we have inherited. That the things our grandparents struggled with that they might have kept them secret run, are running rampant in our life. And sometimes God, only you and that person know about it, but Lord, they can be delivered from that and they can break the yoke of sin and dominion over their life that seeks to influence and destroy them. Lord, we pray for our children today. We pray for our children and our grandchildren. We pray for our heritage afar off. That, Lord, we begin to take steps today to break things off of us spiritually so that our children and our grandchildren do not have to struggle with the things that tear us up and we struggle with. Now, with nobody looking around and every eye closed, I'm not going to call you out. But if you need God to not only save you, but sanctify you for some things, if I preach to you today, raise your hand. Nobody looking around. Anybody else? I see somebody. Yes, good. Anybody else? To pray with me, church. Father, we thank you, God, that you can not only save us, but sanctify us and deliver us. And that we would consider your will. We would consider your way. That we would consider the yoke that we are carrying and who we are carrying it for. Father, be pleased and lift it up and honored today as we seek to break cycles and stop playing games. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I don't know if y'all want to shake hands or not, but wave at two or three people, and we'll see you the next appointed time this Wednesday night. Make sure you stop and sign those picture frames for Mr. Perry.